let me uh, uh, start with the, uh, as a follow-up, uh, some words about DCAD. This is the Dynamic Coalition Accessibility and Disability, uh, which has been uh, created in the uh, second IGF in Rio de Janeiro. And since uh, Rio, uh, we have been present, I think, in all, all of the IGFs in Hyderabad, in Vilnius, in Nairobi, in Baku, and uh, this time as well. Uh, the coalition is coordinated by uh, Andrea Sachs. Uh, probably all of us do know her, and we, we learned a lot from her. Uh, the coalition is uh, not only dynamic in its name, but it's dynamic in its membership as well. Uh, and here I have to stop and pay tribute to one of the members who is not with us anymore. I have to pay tribute to Cynthia Waddle, uh, who passed away this April. And uh, just to tell you that she was a lifelong advocate for the rights of persons with disabilities, she has contributed a lot uh, to the cause. She was uh, involved in the drafting of the UN Convention, and uh, I think we have learned a lot from her, and we miss her, we really miss her. Personally, uh, that was the first time I, I came across with uh, uh, disability issues uh, when I attended the workshop organized by Andrea in the ITU, and uh, Cynthia was the main uh, speaker, and she made me aware of the uh, accessibility issues, especially, especially the issues uh, of web accessibility uh, related to uh, uh, visually impaired persons. So that was the way I got involved, and probably all of us have some memories uh, of her activities. So I think uh, after that, uh, we can uh, continue with the workshop. And uh, the co-organizer of this workshop is the Bidirectional Access Promotion Society, BAPSI. Uh, but probably, Aaron, you are going to talk about your organization a li little bit later. So without uh, much ado, I think I can pass the floor to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Irma Kasinskaita Budaberg from UNESCO. Uh, I would like you to say a few words about yourself first, introduce yourself, and uh, we are eager to hear your presentation. Good morning. I feel like uh, I would like to stand and uh, stand up and go to other side, because there are so many people sitting on my side. But um, if you don't mind, I mean, I can stay where I am as well. It, it depends. Uh, so uh, I'm program specialist from UNESCO, United Nations Special Agency for Education, Science, and Culture. And uh, she shares as well communication information. So sometimes it is forgotten and we are taken as a public relations of UNESCO, but in reality it's an entire sector working on information communication issues. So during last year, so I've been in charge of different types of projects and programs related to ac information accessibility and what we call it in our strategy access to information knowledge for all. Um, I don't see my PowerPoint.
sorry for this um, delay. Um, so coming back to my introduction, um, um, UNESCO is one of the agencies which has well contributed to implementation of uh, United Nations Convention. And we're particularly interested in contributing to the work on, under Article 9, Accessibility 21, uh, um, uh, Access to Information, and uh, 24, Education. We have as well um, a number of activities which are known from uh, the field of inclusive education, but last year so we work more on information accessibility issues. So uh, I have a difficult task, and as well a privilege, because um, I have to present uh, as already Thomas said, something with, it was done jointly, uh, and you can see this report here. You can download as well uh, from the website. And there's another report which is as well done together with a number of, of around, uh, different institutions around the world and experts. And uh, so I'll speak very briefly about the world report which we published in uh, February earlier this year. Um, another report in September which was used for high-level meeting on uh, development and disabilities. And just very briefly introduce what we have. We are coming as well with um, model policy on inclusive uh, ICTs in education. So let's move on. Uh, so what we did with World Report, we wanted first of all to see, to identify, to map what kind of policies are around the world. Because we observed that there are a lot of bottom-up activities which or projects which really contribute significantly to the empowerment of persons with disabilities. And very often we observe that basically uh, we are not co connected to policy. So we could see that there is a gap between policy level and bottom-up activities, so let's say bottom grassroots level activities. So we want to identify what kind of uh, policy are in place in terms of education, in terms of information and communication area. We want as well to look how we are linked or, or not linked. We wanted to identify if there are any, um, are there any open educational resources. It is one of our priorities in UNESCO. Uh, we want to see more open educational resources which would be developed and shared with everyone. And we looked as well for different standards, formats, and what are the budgetary implications and uh, identify any kind of good successful case studies. So, I will not go through all this process, but we targeted five regions. We excluded one region, or half of the region, what we call it, North America and Western Europe. We think that already a lot have been, has been done, so um, we don't have really to concentrate on that. So we looked um, at five regions, what you've seen in the previous slide. So what did we find? You, I just highlighted seven kind of major findings, but there are much more because I don't have much time to speak about this and you can discover in the report. But one what we see, what really clearly confirms what ICTs transform the teaching and learning environment of persons with disabilities. And we observe sometimes that at ministerial level, it is not always obvious. Yes, it transforms uh, the life of, let's say, more or less healthy people, but not necessarily what is understood for persons with disabilities. And sometimes in our community where we work on those issues, it's self-evident but in reality, um, not for everyone. So that is one of the important findings that we discovered. The other one is important as well to consider that ICTs could be used throughout entire lifetime. So it means that uh, even if you haven't done something at primary level, primary uh, educational level, you still can continue to learn and use during your lifetime. And that is what is basically contributes to everyone. So it's nothing different is with persons with disabilities. It's another kind of myth what, let's say, some, some institutions have in mind. The third one, uh, we see what there is a need for policies which would be developed in very holistic manner. And um, I think yesterday was one of the sessions where I gave an example, I can repeat it, one of the classical examples is, but education ministry, even if we have policies on inclusive education, it's not necessary that we will include just like that assistive technologies. So they could purchase a lot of PCs, but they will not buy, having really good deal with uh, uh, private institutions, assistive technologies. And uh, there is another trend around the world that we notice, but there are a lot of specialized schools which are closed now, especially in developed countries. So those kids who are with disabilities and could go to mainstream education, 
we of course transmit, and this is what we call it inclusive education. But at the same time, what we have, what a lot of teachers are not ready. We simply had no training how to accommodate the needs of those kids. And secondly, we don't know how to use assistive technologies. So basically, after the first month, those kids, they fail. And what is happening? There are no schools, specialized schools, so we are kind of in a virtual circle. Uh, let's move on. Uh, what we see as well very often there are um, certain planning, uh, certain planning, so strategies are taken before really looking what is on the ground, without looking and studying and, and mapping, and that is an issue as well. This is why there is a disconnection between policies and activities, what we see, concrete uh, community-based activities. Policies sometimes are disconnected, they are too generic, and we are not based on evidence-based information. Um, there are economic and budgetary pressures, and uh, we could observe as well that uh, financial crisis is a good excuse. Sometimes we hear very, or not sometimes, or quite often we hear that we don't have resources. You didn't have them before, and you don't have now as well. So what is the difference? But now it is very easy to say because there is economical crisis, uh, uh, financial crisis, and that is what is just too high in a way in efficiency and activity. Um, we see as well that there are a number of free and open solutions not only software, but as well we, are, we identified some open educational resources which could be used as well for persons with disabilities and it reduces cost and everybody could share it and adapt it. And we identify a new area which is quite interesting for us, not quite interesting, but interesting for us because we worked a lot with preservation. And um, it is an issue because there are a lot of initiatives, even at UNESCO, where we preserve our information or our heritage which becomes digital heritage, but it's not accessible. So we just put a lot of, a lot of funds to digitize our archives, to make it public. Entire libraries and museums will become accessible in terms of, let's say, accessibility for all, more or less healthy people, but in reality it does not take into consideration that we have to be as well different and accessible for persons with disabilities. So we basically create a lot of, let's say, those uh, virtual um, databases, museums, all kind of, let's say, platforms which accommodate a lot of uh, our cultural heritage, which is at the same time is not accessible. So, um, and plus we came with 18 recommendations for action. So this, uh, this is what you can see. Uh, what's in the middle in orange, uh, which summarize, we have 18, and I don't want to list them because I don't have time, so you can study, but uh, if we just cluster them, it would be inclusive ICT policies, capacity building, accessible content and infrastructure. Basically, nothing new in reality. Huh? We know all this, but I can tell it was a huge problem to have reliable data. That is what was the, really we struggled around the world, working with different partners, and uh, I'm happy with um, uh, there are new initiatives at UN level to come up with uh, measurable statistics. I haven't done. So let me present now our joint uh, work with ITU and a few other partners. Uh, this document was prepared and already Thomas gave a short introduction. Um, it contributed to the high level on um, disability and development which took place in September and a number of regional consultations took place and uh, there is an outcome document which you could find online and it will be used for uh, results for development of post-2015 agenda where really we aimed all UN plus all other stakeholders to include disability aspects in uh, development agenda. So well, already Thomas said we had 150 experts contributing. This is what you can see, the distribution among institutions which participated and provided their comments from all around the world. So uh, this is what you just see, the uh, layout of, uh, of the report. And just I would like to come to some conclusions. So in education, what we find out but websites are dominating as a technology to access information. But it changes a little bit because in primary education we could see as well that television is important as well. 
and this is what is interesting as well, developing educational materials and training teachers to know what kind of technologies, what kind of tools, platforms could be used and what is better to, uh, for children with disabilities or which kind of means which could be used for primary education. After we have secondary and uh, tertiary education where it comes very strongly mobile phones. And that is quite important to know because we could see youngsters um, using all the time phones and it is the same comes to persons with disabilities or say youth with disabilities. There are of course barriers, cost, accessibility and policy issues. These are again classical ones, we know all this and it is frustrating because we just basically state and restate and restate the same things and implementation of policies. So what is the way forward? Governments have to play its own role. We have to create an enabling environment, we have to come up with uh, good procurement policies, uh, legislation. Private sector is as well an important key partner, and we all agree here. I would say we're like a family, we just, I'm afraid I'm repeating something, but you know already basically by definition. But this is with, uh, the findings that it came from uh, 55 countries, and which is important to say, it's important uh, evidence-based information for all of us, because we could use it at national, international level when we have clear data showing that this is what it's important to, to do. So, um, so it relates to prices, training, uh, research and development, employment, um, institutions working with persons with disabilities, and uh, raising awareness, uh, standards, advocacy for policy makers. Uh, UN system as well. And I can tell you what there is a strong interagency support team group for implementation of the convention. So UNESCO will be hosting in a few weeks time a meeting in Paris where basically we, uh, one of the key objectives is to discuss how the outcome document which was adopted uh, in September will be articulated in our strategies and we could see that it's not only just momentum, but there is already a growing interest around UN. So different partners are coming together. So we will be brainstorming how to work next several years. So let's say importantly for 2015, but disability would be much more better mainstream living development goals, which was not the case before. International organizations. Um, so you can find this uh, report on uh, online and just 30 seconds. I would like to let you know what we, uh, when we developed this uh, world report, we came up with some specific um, objectives at UNESCO. And one of them was to come up with model policies for inclusive ICTs in education. And this document is not yet uh, published, but it is in a process of editing. So basically within a few weeks time, it will be available to everyone. So very quickly, it is adaptable model. I, it will be uh, coming uh, as a model example where government ministries of education could take this model and adapt. Basically, it has more or less copy-paste information. You just copy something and you, d you have already more or less uh, own policy. You have to, of course, national adaptation. You have to map what, uh, on the ground what you have kind of specific issues. But it's already, let's say, pre-cooked model and uh, some countries don't have this and we, uh, we really uh, need to invest a lot of time and resources. So we thought this kind of adaptable model could be useful for member states. So it has guiding principles, critical aspects, and we look at uh, system-wide elements, organizational and learners-related uh, issues. And here it is, um, let's say, the process how it could be implemented. And I'm sorry, it's taking more time. No, uh, uh, we, we are extremely grateful because I think your, the information you shared with us is, is very useful and especially when we uh, get back to, to our home countries, uh, it's, it's extremely useful to convey this information to decision makers and to governments. Thank you, Irmgarda, and I, I, I know that you have other commitments, so uh, feel free and... Uh, to, to leave and I'm sure Thomas is uh, able to, to answer your questions. If there are any specific questions you could send by email, unless, I don't know if I can take any little bit. Uh. I have a technical thing. The captioner thinks you're me. You put my name over uh. what you said. Okay. So I'm going to say again, will everybody say their name before they speak? The moderator is Peter Major. Now, even though I'm here, it's not me this time. So it's not Andrea's back. 
And would you put your um, presentation? Thank you. Uh, so, thank you again, uh, Irm Garda. Uh, well, probably uh, it's a, a very good point. I think we go through the presentations and uh, uh, I would like you to, to keep your questions until the end. I, I, I want you to have about 25, 30 minutes discussion if we, we can do that. But you, as uh, it was mentioned, you can always send your questions by email to Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, so we, we are going to have the question answer session uh, uh, at the at the end of this. Okay. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to to pass the floor to Professor Arun Mehta, uh, the president of BAPSI, and I think it was a good introduction for you as well because uh, there were some words about use of mobile phones, and you are very much in it. So Arun, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter. Not just the mobile phones, but also talk about the absence of data and uh, many of the other problems. I hope I'll be able to highlight them a little bit with a more specific, narrow focus. Um, I'm very honored on behalf of BAPSI to be here co-organizing this event where we are discussing something which is essentially the mandate of BAPSI. We look at people who fall between the cracks. Um, some disabled communities, such as those on wheelchairs, those who are blind, those who are deaf, have made significant progress. But can you go to the first slide, please? This is so we can move my name off. Uh, just go to the next slide, please. Should I do it myself? Oh, okay. Yeah, good. All right. You'll do it from there? Excellent. Okay. So we talk about universal access. However, there are significant large communities for whom there is no plan as to how we are going to get them onto the internet. And for, they may as well be living in the Middle Ages as far as their access to information is concerned. One of these groups is the deaf blind. And we'll talk about that. But it's not just about that that uh, uh, I will be talking. Um, even if you look at it from a mainstream perspective, uh, when telecom companies now look at how they might reach people in greater numbers, um, the penetration of mobile phones, smartphones, and so on is starting to taper off. Those who could use mobile phones already have one. Now we need to look for other groups who so far have been excluded. And this is the, a very significant way for companies to grow their business. And, not o and also, existing users of smartphones can find new ways to use their devices if they become more accessible. Now, uh, what I'm talking about is haptic communication, which is the only way that data can flow from a mobile phone or from an electronic device to a person who is deafblind. Um, when we started to use the ear for communicating information, that was the birth of language. That was huge for the human being. Similarly, when we started to use the eye for the communication of information, that was amazing because that was the invention of writing. Now, haptic communications, which is the use of touch for information communication, uh, is hardly used except by the deafblind and by some blind people who uh, also use uh, refreshable braille displays. Um, so if we, and we have found that, you know, when we start using touch to access our phones, the touch screen, the smartphone, what that has done to the phones, but that's only touch in one direction. If the phone can communicate with you back via touch, that may be as revolutionary potentially as the invention of writing. And so therefore, it's something that uh, phone companies need to look at very seriously now as they try to find new ways to you know, beat each other in competition. Now, 
Touch is an extremely powerful sense. This is used by all species when they communicate. Um, and we are, we are used to using, I mean, when we write, we are taking advantage of touch as well. Um, now, in phones, unfortunately, the only haptic communication that is possible is using uh, the vibrate. And that's what, we, what we've been doing. But that is a very, very rudimentary form of uh, haptic communication. And uh, this, with that, we are able to bring the deaf lines to a level that the rest of us reached 170 years ago. I'll talk about that a little bit. But uh, people who play uh, video games, they are familiar with haptic communication because a lot of the joysticks and wheels and so on will let you know when you've gone over a bump or when you shoot a bullet or something. But more seriously, it is also used, for example, in remote surgery, which has become increasingly important, particularly for developing countries. That, uh, and, but there too, the surgeon needs a feedback, he, otherwise you know, he might just cut too much. But this is not using touch for communicating information. This is, you might say, non-verbal communication that is going on in a haptic form. Now, what exactly, when we say, you know, falling between the cracks, what does that mean? So I'm taking the example of the deafblind in India. Now, first of all, in the census, we don't properly even count them. And that is a serious problem. Imgada talked about the, uh, the absence of data. Now, there is an estimate that there are a million deafblind people in India. One million is a significant number. And there isn't a single deafblind child in the school system in Delhi, which is the capital of the country. So you can imagine what is the state of education of people who are deafblind in the country. And these are not people who can organize and stand up and shout. And in a developing country, you know, only those who are able to shout and you know, get themselves heard uh, actually get their problems addressed. So it, there is an urgent need for the rest of us to get involved with problems such as these, people who are unable to represent themselves, people with multiple disabilities, people with cognitive disabilities, etc. Um, there is a school in uh, Rome that, I, uh, that uh, Andrea helped me find where they have children uh, between the ages of three months and four years old. And uh, when I talked to them about the apps that we are developing which can allow a deafblind person to send and receive text messages, they said, well, reading and writing is going to come in their future at some point, right now, you're struggling in trying to teach them what does dad and what does mom mean. So uh, we are, you know, walking is a major struggle for you if you're a deafblind person. It's much harder to learn things that so many of us take for granted. However, uh, now that we're talking about haptic communications, the deafblind are world leaders in this area. They have developed ways of communicating information through touch that are quite unique and, and very, very useful. For example, you can, a deafblind person can wear a cheap glove with ABCD printed at different places. The tips of your fingers are the five vowels. And by simply touching the person's hand at different places, you can communicate quite easily with them. So there are in interesting ways. However, these are not ways that you can easily communicate with through the computer. Um, what we did was, uh, I think we would, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, if you move to the next screen, we, uh, which is Bopsy's apps for verbal haptics, uh, I, I really I do not have the time here to talk in any detail about Bopsy. Those, many of you perhaps know us. Those of you who don't, please come and find me outside. I'll be at the uh, stall of the Seed Alliance for the next two hours, and we can talk about what we do. Let me just briefly talk about what we do with the deaf line. As a student project over summer, after a discussion that I had with Fernando Botello of the DCAD at Vilnius, um, we took advantage of the vibrate in the phone to do Morse code. And you know, I have that on my phone, and I'd be happy to show you. And so you can uh, basically, you know, Morse code is what, when telecommunication started, when there was just a wire going from one end to the other, 170 years ago, Morse code was used. It's still used a lot by people in, uh, in amateur radio, in the, in, uh, in the armed forces, etc. But essentially, uh, this is not a great way to communicate. Uh, there, are, there are definitely better ways that need to be developed. 
uh, we are fortunate that we got a grant from the Internet Society Innovation Fund, which is also partly why I was able to come here. And we are going to be focusing on this for a year. And so please, uh, we need your help. We are a very small NGO. There seems to be nobody else working in this area. And uh, we do free and open so source software for people who are deafblind, and which works off of a standard device that you can buy next door rather than getting something imported which costs a lot of money and is hard to repair. Um, so uh, now I come, what I would like to spend a little bit of time on is what do we, what is our recommendation? How do we take this forward? What needs to be done? We are working a little bit with the ITU and we hope to take that forward that if we can set appropriate standards, make some sort of recommendations so that any phone that any uh, you know, that is available in the world should with very little difficulty be accessible to a person who is deafblind. I think that is a human right. I think the UN Convention requires that and I think we can definitely move forward with the ITU's help on that. Um, we definitely need uh, more research into smartphones and visibility. Uh, there are many categories of disabled persons who have extreme difficulty with smartphones. I work with children with cerebral palsy for, for whom this practically does not work. However, with, if there were some, if the hardware designers were a little bit more sensitive to this, I'm sure a lot could be done. Um, and so more research needs to be, uh, uh, and one of my, uh, let's say, passions, you know, I'm six years old and if I still have a dream left, it is to set up a facility where engineers behave the way doctors do that they deal with persons one at a time, where you can go with a technology need the way you can go to a hospital with a medical need. And that would be a great place to be doing this kind of research because they would be working directly with people whose needs are not being served. And, uh, you know, this could throw up a lot of amazing ideas which would be very useful for the mainstream as well. Uh, another area that I think needs more attention, this is, I know, for three years I was a volunteer at the National Association for the Blind with Dipendra Manocha, who's uh, with us in remote, uh, where, and where I was teaching computer programming to blind people. And uh, in my <laughs> experience as a teacher, this was the most satisfying experience that I have ever had. And I would love to do this again, and uh, I'm even prepared to volunteer time for this. But uh, much better than giving a person fish is to teach the person how to catch fish, as the Bible tells us. And we really need to be working on that. Um, and last uh, but not least, uh, at, at this forum there is a lot of discussion on intellectual property rights. And the area of haptic communications is so critical for the deafblind community and even for the blind community and actually eventually for all of us that it would be a great pity if patterns and these sorts of things were to hold this very, very significant technology back. I'm expecting that if patterns had been as strong earlier, then we may not have had screen readers and other things coming into you know, computers as easily as they did. So let us try and keep haptic technology you know, a little bit un outside the you know, fight over patents that is going on worldwide. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Arun. Uh, as, as always, I am fascinated by the work you are doing, and, and uh, it, it really uh, commands humility from all of us. Uh, thank you again, and uh, you touched upon very sensitive issues, and especially you mentioned the, the standards. You know, we have uh, uh, representatives from the ITU, but we have also representatives from the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, uh, uh, Shadi is one of the main experts on uh, standards. So Shadi, uh, I would like to ask you to, to give your presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot. And while, while the presentation is being loaded, uh, my name is Shadi Abuzara. I work with the W3C Web Exhibit Initiative. I, I think the two previous uh, talks were I think really useful in setting the higher level stage um, about um, how it's looking internationally and then looking at particular groups that I think are, are, are really most interesting. I think uh, looking at accessibility as, as a motor of innovation and if we can solve certain issues I think it, it helps any, uh, everyone. Um, 
Um, so I do want to continue uh, a little bit on the topic of mobile and, and, and uh, uh, or the plethora of devices and access mechanisms and also um, the, 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 the um, groups of disabilities that are less well served. So uh, my talk is called Referencing and Applying the W3C Way Standard Work Act 2 in Different Contexts. And um, you can actually go to the next slide already. Um, basically, what I uh, want to be talking about in, 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 this, um, um, in, in, in this talk is how uh, things have evolved and, uh, and, and uh, are changing and how to actually use this important piece of standard in different situations that each of us may be in. But just to back up a little bit and just give the overview of web accessibility, it's going to get a, a little bit technical. Um, there, there's an image um, on, on, on the screen, and uh, in the PowerPoint, it does have a text alternative, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which means that people can actually get a, a, a different, uh, you know, the textual information instead of the, 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 uh, the image. Um, and on this image, it, it's just to illustrate the different standards that work together to enable web accessibility. It's a little bit technical. Uh, but let me walk you through it. So on the bottom of the image of this illustration, we have the core specifications that are used to create websites and web content, HTML and XML and so on. That's what the programmers use to create the websites. And on top of that, we have the accessibility guidelines that developers can follow to develop accessible content and tools. On the left-hand side, we have the authoring tool accessibility guideline, which is ATAG. And um, that's uh, mainly to talk about the development part of web content. So how to develop authoring tools that are accessible um, and that also produce accessible content. So I want to emphasize that part that the tools themselves need to be accessible because also people with disabilities, especially in the web 2.0, uh, are contributors and are authors and so on. On the right-hand side, we have the users who use browsers and, and the media players and so on, but also sometimes assistive technologies in addition to access the web content and to interact with the website. Uh, for instance, screen readers that we heard about uh, or other mechanisms. Um, and in the middle is the actual content itself and how to design that content in a way that it can be rendered in different ways to, uh, according to people's needs and preferences. Um, so for that is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, the WCAG 2.0 um, that I've mentioned. So this is an internationally recognized standard by many organizations and governments around the world as the standard for web accessibility. It's been around since 1999, but the second version is operational since December 2008. So that's the second generation of the guidelines. That has also recently, in 2012, so last year, uh, become adopted by ISO, the International Standards Organization, as ISO IEC 40500. Now that's very useful for uh, uh, governments and organizations that can't reference consortia st standards, such as WCC, and that need uh, internationally uh, recognized standards. So it is. We have right now 30 translations that are either in, um, already available or in progress. Uh, for those um, 10 already completed so-called authorized translations. That means those translations underwent a community review process and are now recognized as the authorized translations, authorized versions. And, uh, but we welcome more translations. So if, uh, <laughs> I'd love to be, um, if, if, if people want um, um, to translate those guidelines in the languages of, of, of their countries, uh, we would love to work with you on that. Um, and so um, around WCAG 2, there's also a number of supporting resources to help, for instance, awareness raising and educate access or, you know, uh, provide introductions on accessibility. We see that the main barriers very often when developers don't understand what do they need to do. Uh, very often, there, there are many things that are actually quite simple uh, if the developers understand what they need to do. Um, the text alternative example just earlier on, once a developer understands, okay, an image cannot be read out loud by a screen reader, so I need to provide an alternative, that's fairly straightforward concept to understand, and that gets the developer much more understanding what they actually need to do. 
We also have um, implementation techniques. So the guidelines are designed specifically in a way that are technology independent and, and, and technology neutral so that they can apply to different, say, HTML or to PDF or to, uh, you know, on the mobile or on an intranet and, and so on, all those different contexts. Um, and we're also right now developing tutorials through an EC-funded project uh, that has actually funded my trip over here. Um, <laughs> um, we also have a before and after demo. Uh, we like to show, uh, short that to acronym BAD. Uh, <laughs> it's a small miniature website um, available in two versions. One is totally accessible, one is totally inaccessible. Um, so you can go back and forth and see the differences. It has inline annotations and so on. So there's a lot of resources um, also on how to evaluate and manage accessibility. So all those things together to actually explain and promote the development and implementation of accessibility. But as I mentioned before, uh, you know, in, in my intro, um, the, the landscape is changing. Uh, we, we, we have, um, you know, the technologies are evolving very rapidly, also the policies, the practices, and so on. We have countries um, without any um, policies, for instance, or with different types of policies, for instance, procurement policies, uh, like in the U.S., which have made quite a substantial change. Other countries have uh, policies on government, on public uh, sector um, uh, uh, websites and web content. We have other countries that have um, disability discrimination uh, approaches and so on. So some have several of those and so on. Um, so we have all those different policy situations that are uh, a person or organization can be in. We also have an increasing amount of web applications and rich dynamic content, which uh, is really great. Um, dynamic content, um, you know, is sometimes very useful for people, say, with cognitive and learning disabilities. It's more intuitive to use, it's easier to use, but it does at the same time also take more thinking about and, and more ways of handling how do I um, make that uh, you know, the, all this uh, interaction uh, more accessible. Um, we see the uptake of HTML5 uh, increasing very strongly. So, um, and, 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 and all the different uh, rapid, te you know, technologies emerging around HTML5, uh, for instance, accessing uh, your camera uh, on, on, on the phone through the browser, through HTML5 and all those things, uh, you know, along with it, of course, all the security and uh, privacy protocols and so on. So there's, there's, there's this whole uh, aspect here of HTML5, which is really great, I think, uh, but, but, but at the same time, it does take more skills from the developer to be able to use those technologies. And finally, um, as, as you know, um, the previous speakers also touched upon, is, is the different devices that are now being used to access uh, the, the web and to interact with it, which is really great. Uh, mobile devices, um, tablets, televisions, uh, and, and many more. We, we talk about, you know, the car entertainment systems. Uh, we talk about information screens in the, you know, in the underground and public terminals and, and so on. All this is becoming web-enabled, um, which is good in a way uh, at the same time, as I said. Uh, so, um, you know, very changing landscape, very different context in which you, you may be in. So the question is really, okay, how do I, in my particular situation, my particular context, actually apply WCAG to how do I reference it, how do I adopt it, and, and so on. So um, what we did also through this EC-funded project called the Way Act project um, um, that I've mentioned and that I actually want to uh, say a word or two about at the end, um, uh, we, we organized a so-called WCC workshop, uh, which um, uh, brings together different stakeholders to discuss a particular issue. Uh, and, and so that was the issue at hand. We wanted to discuss some of the different approaches that people are already taken, some of the experiences that people have with different policies and, and how to work with those, um, how to um, also to, to foster sharing of existing resources. We know a lot of people have developed their own resources or approaches or, or, or ways of how to uh, support WCAG2. And also um, for us to learn from that, to identify priorities for us as WCC on how we can further uh, develop, um, you know, supporting resources and supporting materials to help you uh, adopt and implement WCAG 2.
So there's a workshop report currently in development. I, I was hoping it would be completed <laughs> for today's session, but it is in the works and it will be uh, available publicly as well uh, on, 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 on the website. But um, some of the main uh, outcomes to highlight is um, th there was an increased need or, or a need for in yet more guidance on evaluation and testing, particularly with web applications and all those uh, more complex settings that we're in, uh, how to actually effectively uh, do evaluation and testing on that. Um, there was also a need for assessing the so-called accessibility support in emerging technologies. Now that's a bit of a complex um, or, 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 or a technical matter, uh, more or less, but the idea is uh, you have an accessibility feature, say, the text alternative for the image that, that I talked about earlier. Now you have a new mobile phone uh, with a new version of an operating system and a, and a, and a different browser. Um, how well is that feature supported in that particular uh, you know, situation versus on a desktop uh, computer and, and so on? So you have all those different devices and so on. And y you need to be able as a developer to be able to rely, if I implement something, will it actually work uh, you know, in, in those different systems? Um, so there's need for that as, uh, as well. There's need for uh, more guidance on, on implementing, so similar, uh, the accessibility support, but also how do I apply something in, in mobile? How does WCAG 2 apply to mobile is one of the hottest questions that we have right now. We see, for instance, uh, the BBC has developed its own um, uh, mobile accessibility guidelines, which in a way is good because they're, they're trying to be proactive and trying to implement accessibility on their mobile site as well. But at the same time, uh, we then start getting different standards and, and different guidelines. And again, the, the developer is confused, okay, which standard should I follow and how should I uh, implement that? So um, we need to, I think, provide more information and more support on that. Um, and and, and uh, finally, we also talked a lot about policies and how um, you know, policies could hard code the, the technology requirements, which then causes synchronization issues. I mean, for instance, the U.S. right now, um, legally speaking, the Section 508 still requires uh, a, a, a version of a reduced version of WCAG 1 <laughs> um, because um, you know it hasn't been updated since uh, 2003 or something, um, and, and they're still updating that that uh, policy requirement. Of course, the general understanding is people should be using WCAG 2 because it helps developers more. Uh, but that's the issue that policies are sometimes slower than standards already are. <laughs> and so that has a cascade of issues. Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, finally, I, I just want to mention some of the new developments that we're working on that might address some of those issues and I think that might be interesting to some of you in the room. Um, we are looking at increased production of techniques, um, so guidance on how to actually implement the guidelines and work out too. We have um, a task force specifically on HTML5 and way ARIA uh, techniques. We also have a task force on mobile accessibility. Um, uh, we are working on uh, a harmonized web accessibility conformance evaluation methodology and a crowdsourced accessibility support database. I can talk about this in more detail later on if, if somebody has a particular question. But I think one thing that I want to particularly highlight uh, is, is a new task force that we're still about to launch on cognitive and learning disabilities because this is one of the groups that we know is traditionally underserved in accessibility in general just because we don't fully understand the questions and how to actually uh, code those requirements into testable um, guidelines. Um, so that becomes a real challenge. How do we actually uh, understand the requirements and, and, and code them in, in, you know, in, in, in testable requirements? So uh, there's a whole area of challenge, so I'm very excited by this new task force that we're working on. And um, I just want to thank also um, the European-funded project, the Way Act project, uh, that uh, a lot of the work that I've explained today is being carried out through that funding and that also uh, supported my participation at this uh, IGF. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shad. Shadi, uh, it's, it's always uh, uh, great to, to listen to your work and uh, personally I, I am grateful because uh, I've been involved in this 
uh, using using the standards and uh, it made me aware of a lot of things and uh, thank you for c calling our attention between the discrepancies of the of the advance of technology of the of the uh, standard and policy well that's a, that's a also a, a, a brand new way of looking at things uh, thank you again and now I pass the floor to Gunella Asbring uh, please Gunella Thank you very much, Peter, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to last brink, and, and my current title is Australian IDF Ambassador, and I'd like to explain what that means. Uh, um, I'm fortunate to have received funding through the AUDA, the Australian Domain Administration, um, to organise a workshop uh, last week at the Australian IDF and, uh, and that gave me the possibility to come here and, uh, and speak as well. And the Australian uh, workshop, uh, we had um, representatives from um, government talking about the, um, the national transition strategy on web accessibility and, uh, and it's um, pleasing to report that uh, in Australia, the, uh, the government is moving towards level AAA by the end of next year. Um, there's a lot of complexities involved with that, as we all know. Uh, and, uh, and we also had a government representative from the National Disability Insurance Agency who spoke about uh, uh, the, the future way they are going to include accessibility criteria when purchasing their IT systems and we heard about uh, cyber safety and also a relevance here is the presentation by a deafblind woman in Australia and she was um, using sign language, um, um, touching sign language and uh, it had a big impact on the audience and um, her use of technology and this was in a project um, about digital literacy and technology um, usage by blind, deaf blind people. Uh, she uses, for example, um, a, an iPhone with a small Braille keyboard, uh, which wears out fairly quickly because of the intense use. And it's very expensive. And so it not necessarily useful in, in developing countries. Um, so, but today I'm going to speak about public procurement and accessibility. We've already heard it mentioned uh, several times. Um, so what, what exactly is public procurement? Well, it's actually the government pro uh, purchasing processes. The government is a large purchaser of goods and services, which obviously includes ICT, and that can be phones, computers, public service terminals, and obviously a range of software applications. Accessibility criteria in public procurement um, has a number of functions. Uh, the, the primary function uh, and the obvious function is to provide more streamlined IT provision for persons with disability in the government workplace. But it has flow-on effects for greater availability and affordability of accessible ICT in the general community. And this is what's so important, that the government can influence the market by setting purchasing criteria, including accessibility. Now, examples of accessibility criteria, and these are only some examples, um, and it's an ability to use a display for a person without sight, an ability to use an interface for a person without hearing, ability to use an interface for a person with physical limitations, enabling seamless use of assistive technologies with common computer problems, and also, very importantly, preventing common computer programs from rendering inbuilt accessibility features defunct. And we've seen that with, um, with um, Microsoft systems. Uh, that, that uh, um, have the accessibility features, but um, the IT systems within an organisation uh, disable them in various ways. 
So um, we did a research project in Australia. Um, another hat I have is my consultancy GSA in Infocom and um, worked with the University of Wollongong, uh, Dr. Will Tibben, and uh, this research project was funded by the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network. We did a study and benchmarking of OECD countries and their use of accessibility criteria and did a detailed analysis of six case study places, USA, Japan, the European Commission, Ireland, UK and Canada. We also ran focus groups with people with disabilities um, for them to tell us about their experiences in the workplace with ICT. The main findings, and I'll just briefly talk about that, um, the majority of the OECD countries include ICT accessibility criteria in public document law regulation. Um, but in this group, the, the great majority allow discretion in application of accessibility criteria when procuring ICT. In other words, it's voluntary. And, and uh, in, this, uh, in this group is, um, are many European countries. Um, half, of the, half of this group have some reporting and compliance measures in place, um, but it needs to go a lot further. I want to touch on two particular examples. The US, um, it's a model case. This is where it all started. And it started with Section 508, which is an amendment of a Rehabilitation Act, to enable US public servants with disabilities to use office equipment on an equitable basis to their able-bodied peers. And through that uh, were developed the Section 508 guidelines or standards, whatever you want to call them. And uh, this is the accessibility criteria for use by government agencies in their tender documents. And I've, I've stated clearly, this is mandatory. Officials in the government need, they have to use these accessibility criteria. doesn't mean they always do it, but it is mandatory. And um, that, that means that any, except for Department of Defence, and there are some exceptions, but uh, in general terms, um, government officials need to use the criteria. It doesn't mean that suppliers who are responding to requests for tender need to specify accessibility features, but obviously it will help their tender if they do so. Together with anti-discrimination legislation, it has had a positive impact on companies, and, and two to highlight here, Apple and Microsoft, uh, when designing mainstream products that are more accessible. I've mentioned anti-discrimination legislation because it certainly has helped the process along. Um, now, uh, Shad has already mentioned about um, some of the old parts of the current Section 508 guidelines. Um, the, the guidelines have gone through a refresh process, as they call it, and uh, it is now with the um, US legislature to, to actually approve those and to move forwards on them. And we live in hope that this may happen next year. Another case is the European Commission. Um, Mandate 376 um, was for three European standards bodies to develop accessibility guidelines in line, harmonised with Section 508 in the US. And I'm pleased to report, as of this week, um, um, those accessibility guidelines have been approved by the joint working group. They still have some way to go through the voting process, but uh, um, hopefully that process uh, will be finalised again uh, sometime early next year. So we are moving along here and it's, it is encouraging. There's also a toolkit for suppliers uh, to assist suppliers in understanding because there's a lot of awareness needed and often it's that lack of awareness which is a big issue. European accessibility legislation, if enacted, will make accessibility criteria in public procurement mandatory in European Union countries. That will have a huge impact. 
So, um, uh, before I go to the conclusion, I, I, I also just wanted to mention um, the, the publication we heard about before, the ICT Opportunity for a Disability Inclusive Development Framework. Um, I actually um, did input to, to that um, um, uh, policy document and it, it, it's, it's refreshing to see that um, the priority actions for governments uh, um, equal number two is about incorporating accessibility requirements in procurement policy. So that means we're talking across um, not just OECD countries but really globally. So I've the, the final page um, refers to the um, uh, where you can get online information about that research report and we also did an advocacy toolkit for organisations, uh, disability organisations to work with their governments uh, to enlighten them about this. I have a print copy here of the advocacy uh, the advocacy toolkit and the actual research report for your information. Thank you. Thank you, Gunella. It was uh, really a very interesting facet of the uh, very complex issue we are dealing with here. And now I would like to have a remote participant. Uh, 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 eventually, we may like to have Ipendra, if you can hear us and if you uh, like to intervene. Dipendra? Hello, Dipendra. Uh, Jerry, Jerry, you are there? Yeah. Uh, I, I can, I'm just, uh, somebody has read up that you are asking for me to intervene. I have not been saying, unfortunately, but I just came to know that you are asking for my intervention through the chat. Uh, so, um, I've just gone through the presentations, uh, the slides, someone has just read out those slides to me. So, yes. Uh, if you're asking for my presentation, I think that the video would be, would be better because I don't think I can make a live presentation in such case where I don't hear anything like from the room. So it means that you want to interview a bit later? No, we oh. Have oh. Okay, we are going to play the video. Dipendra, we have your presentation on screen. Are you with us?
So, uh, Dipendra, uh, uh, we try to get back to you and to Jerry as well, but first let, uh, let me pass the floor to Andrea for her presentation. And uh, then eventually, if you manage to get you online, then uh, you will have your presentation. Okay? So, I pass the floor to Andrea Sachs. Andrea. I don't know if you can hear me, guys, but we're trying to repair the sound. And um, actually, this is about remote participation. Um, okay, and it says, not as easy as it sounds or seen by persons with disabilities. Um, this is no reflection on the people who are working here. There are many technical problems that are existing with the internet and with some of the fact that they were not, that they, the team didn't get out here until barely a day before and training was not provided until late and there were lots of different problems that I think we will address now to the IGF Secretariat. Also with the particular problem of uh, the actual tool not really being accessible to blind people and the fact that uh, they were not prepared to do, or uh, had the experience to make the calls the way we normally make them at the ITU. But they're learning and they're getting there and uh, WebEx and Cisco are now seriously looking at the problem. So let me go through so everybody in the room understands what some of the problems are. So could I have the next slide? Okay, I did write this out. Oh, is that the next one? That too. I did write this out so when somebody could take it away, they'd understand the points, but I have pictures as well. I think all of us thought that we were going to be able to do remote participation and include persons with disabilities when we first saw these tools, but it didn't happen that way. We were overly optimistic. We didn't know how they worked, and we began to find difficulties. Um, we have to learn now to adapt to what we have because we're not able to get companies to change these things right away. So we have to take what we have and adapt to it to make it work for us, which is what we've been doing during this whole session. So um, can we have the next slide, please? Now, this is the way people do business. It's not bad. It's the way you make money but there is a one-size-fits-all strategy in remote tools. And though uh, the majority of the population can use the tool, people with disabilities, persons with disabilities have great difficulty. And one of the problems is, is that the blind person, and I'll go into that in a minute, cannot navigate the page and listen to the uh, actual co conversation that is going on. Um, sometimes we can't do captions, the document, the chat box at the same time. So we have to switch pages. There, uh, other times the captioning pod is put on the wrong place. If they do have one, it's line by line. It is not uh, word for word, which is real-time text. So consequently, we have a problem in timing issues where somebody might want to be able to comment. If you were deaf, you might be able to raise your hand. You might want to maybe say something. But by the time you're recognized and get to the and have the information that, that ready to comment, they've moved on to something else. But you don't know that. You don't understand that that has happened. Keep going. I'm going to just keep yakking here. Now I want to show you this. I'm, I said I'd do pictures. Here is a WebEx page, and they were good. They did try to put captioning on the same page, but they've covered up the chat box. You can only see three people, and um, it's also difficult to read because the print's small. I'm not sure everybody can read yellow on blue, though traditionally we do use yellow on blue because more people can grab that than others. But somebody may want to do black on white, white on black. Well, the person who is watching the captioning who may have a vision problem also, because deafblind people are not totally, totally, totally in darkness or totally and totally in no hearing, um, you know, in silence, they have different magnitudes of different possibilities of, of being able to take in information. And they may want to adjust the font. They may want to be able to look at it over a wider basis. And if you did adjust the font to have it bigger, you might only have four words and three lines. 
So that's not going to work either. So you can't use the chat box. You can't read what's there. Nice try, but that's not right. Next one. Now, I want to show you a picture. This is one of my favorites. This is Joanna who works with us. She is a sign language interpreter. Uh, she's really wonderful. And the little man in the picture is my vice chair, totally deaf. He lives in England. He can't always afford to come to Geneva and doesn't always get fellowships to come. So what he, they've done is they've set up a system where we can participate remotely. How many devices have we got there? One, two, three at each end. Now, how many people have the ability to pay for that many devices? Um, we're techno freaks. We work with the ITU, so we're a little bit abnormal. But, I mean, this is impossible in developing countries. This is impossible for the average person. They're lucky if they have one. And do they have the expertise to be able to do this? Not always. Though I have discovered probably the highest level of expertise among persons with disabilities who have the, have the money to buy devices is, is magnificent. They can pat their heads and rub their stomachs on the same time, but because they adapt to what's there. But... The, the financial aspect is the problem. Now, what you see is we see uh, Christopher there, and that's where they do their signing. They're using an iPod device. Then you have a regular computer. That's the Adobe Connect with the full chat box. So when Joanne gets the information from Christopher by interpreting his her signs, she raises her hand. She speaks to me or whoever's chairing the meeting and says the question, I respond or somebody responds and she signs it back. But she's, she's the one that's running that because it's faster if you have signed than for him to try and type. And also English is not necessarily, or a, a written language is not necessarily a deaf person's first language. It's usually signed. Now, if you're born culturally in it, now it's totally different for people who are deaf and later in life or who are not culturally deaf and they exist also. Then you notice that we have the captioning there, full page captioning. We also are going to see how we can adjust that if you have it on a separate page. Can I have the next slide? Now, uh, I'll come to that in a minute. About I'll show you the difference. Now, here we've got, it's nearly impossible for blind and sight challenged people and deaf blind people to participate. Now, you've had an indication of today how we've been hooking up with blind people by calling them on a separate line. They have obviously managed to get on, but we have a bad sound problem now, so they may or may not be hearing me. But they'll get the captioning later and can realize what I've said. Now, if they're using a screen reader, they have to switch that off and d disengage from my voice, the meeting, whatever, in order to navigate the page. There should be a way where we have buttons that will click it back for two audios very quickly so they can do that. The navigational processes of how to raise your hand should be very easy, and there should be a page in the table of contents to be able to switch to a page that makes it easy and fast to do that. Um, we've been, I've been talking to the previous guy who used to do all of the technical uh, work for the IGF, and I was explaining this to him. He got it in one. He's already designing a page in his head, and I'm beginning to think it's going to be possible. But the problem is getting industry to do that is another problem because, again, the people who make these devices don't necessarily have the ability to control the funding to do it. And a lot of these guys still think that uh, persons with disabilities is a, is a niche market. But it isn't because as we get older, and I'm, I'm almost 67 years old, and I'm losing my sight. My hearing is going down, and it's a good thing I can sign and lip read, but uh, a lot of people are not gifted with having deaf parents who wanted to speak about something they didn't want me to know about, so I learned how to communicate without sound. So the problem is they have to recognize that there's a huge population out there of people who would benefit by making things easy and simple to use where you didn't have to have a tutorial to learn how to use it, which is what the IGF used to do, which wasn't a bad idea. So here we have blind people having to come on by somebody actually helping them. 
They are not independent. That's not right. They can't raise their hand. They can't, they, if they get disengaged from the call, there's going to be a problem for them to get back on. And there, for people who have site problems, who are using the captioning additionally, they might have to have two browsers, in fact, at the way it is now, because they can't adjust the color, the size, or stop the scrolling to go back or top to bottom to see something that they've missed without having a URL page, which is different and is not a captioning pod within the remote participation tool. Next slide, please. Okay, here it is. Now, this actually was given to me by Roy Graves of Caption First, who is doing the captioning here. And all the kids that I, I know a lot of these people who do the captioning, having worked with them for, oh, God, six, seven years now, and they know all the vocabulary and everything else, but sometimes I find it better to have a larger, a larger thing. I wish I could expand it, but it has the font. It has the size. It's just like your computer in Word. It has the scroll button. You can unclick it and go to wherever you think you missed it if you want to go back and review something. But you can click it back on and it goes right back without losing a single bit of text to be able to read that. You can change the colors. You can't do that in a pod. And the other problem is what if the pods that are developed now not are very good. There's one that is coming out. It's coming out in not WebEx. It's coming out in Adobe, and it's not bad. It hasn't broken yet. We've managed to get that sorted out. But the thing is, not everybody uses the same kind of technology or standards. we got problems. We've got competition. My tricks are better than your tricks. I want to sell my a remote tool or I'm donating this tool and though I get along great with the Cisco guys and they're listening to me and there might be some good changes happening especially since I've made a big noise we can possibly get them to cooperate and interoperate between themselves so we have um, we have something that we call um, interoperability because one of the things in that pink book that was mentioned, what I wrote in that pink book, because I'm in there, was that we wanted to have industry take responsibility and cooperate. So we have interoperability. The phone gets all the phones. You can call any phone you like. But we still haven't got there because proprietary standards take precedent and create isolation and new barriers. Next slide. Now, how I got... I think I've got a couple more slides and that's it. And we have to close because we've got five minutes. Anyway, there are more problems. Uh, I'm, going, I'm not going to go into, I've said that already about the tools and there's not a perfect device. And we need to do one more thing. We need to, cha to train moderators and chairmen how to communicate with people who are on remote who have disabilities. And that we talked about in the DICAD meeting, and we will be making a report, which will, we will be submitting to the web page of the IGF. We'll be making some comments. Shadi's going to make some comments in the main meeting about how we train moderators and chairmen how to deal with what we've got. Because we've got to ask Jerry or Dependra or check on them. They've been signaling me that the sound wasn't good, so I was able to communicate to the chairman that we had a problem. Next page. And the conclusion, we need to train good practice, we need, we need to create good practice training for chairmen, and we need to listen to persons with disabilities when designing the conference tools, and we need to give the money to, to industry has to give the money to research and development, and industry needs to cooperate with each other to do this, to have interoperability. And secondly, we need to make it transparent for everybody to use, not just persons with disabilities. We don't want to have to have tutorials or make it like your remote control for your, for your television where your child can do it and you can't. We want it to be easy. And that's my presentation on the problems of remote participation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, well, you touched upon the very important point, and uh, I'm sorry that it did happen again, that we, uh, uh, we have uh, intention to have remote participants uh, to get in, and we didn't manage. It, it did, happen, uh, did happen last year as well. He can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> can we do, can we, uh, we can do something? Uh, well, I, I would like to...
to take some questions because there were, there were questions uh, and we have to wrap up. Uh, uh, we can go into lunch if people would like to stay. Uh, all right. So, Dipendra, you can hear me. The more important that we, we should be hearing you. Jerry? Can you hear us? Jerry? I can barely hear. Barely. Barely. Can you hear us? Well, uh, we can hear you. Well, barely. Barely. Can you hear us? Well, uh, we can hear you. Well, barely. And in addition to that, we have the echo and uh, the sound going around. So I, I, I don't believe we can, we can, we can make it. In addition, we have the echo. Uh, okay. Uh, so I, I'm, af I'm, af I'm afraid uh, we, we cannot have the remote part. Uh, Peter, this is uh, Dipendra. If uh, if you can uh, hear Nick uh, Kirby or uh, I had actually sent a video also of the presentation. So if you're not so probably what we can do is we, we shall post uh, your video and the, all the contributions on the ITU website. ITU website, and I would like to encourage you to go to the ITU website on the uh, DCAD. And uh, before closing, I would like to take some questions if you have one. Yes, please. Uh, hello, I am Shavitri. I'm from Indonesia. Uh, I'm a lecturer of Faculty of Medicine. Uh, what I want to say that uh, we hope that uh, not only for persons with disability, but also for the uh, for the parents of the children with disability, especially for uh, uh, mental or uh, intellectual disability, because they are, they depend on the parents, yeah, they are remote, and also not only for the disability person, I mean uh, not only the, uh, the person, but also for the uh, professional, like a doctor, like a um, therapist. So uh, I mean uh, the ICT as a, an enabler for the, for the medical education or for the, uh, uh, for the doctor, for the nurse, for the, especially in the developing countries to, to understand and to manage uh, the need of the Disable, uh, disable, uh, yeah. How to, uh, how to manage them? How to uh, understand them? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you for this contribution. Arun, you'd like to to comment on that? Thank you, Peter. And thank you very much for that question. Uh, we have been working with children with cognitive disabilities in India, and we are very aware of the problems that you are discussing. Uh, indeed, for us, the caregiver community is extremely important when we are talking with persons with cognitive disabilities and multiple disabilities. Um, we try to treat the caregiver and the child as a unit. Very often, it is much easier for us to teach something to the parent or to the teacher and then allow that person to slowly teach that to the child over weeks and months. Um, that is, on the one hand, it is extremely helpful, but on the other hand, sometimes it is also an obstacle. Sometimes the caregiver uh, has, uh, like for example, if, it's a, if that's a professional person, may have, may lack training of the kind in ICTs and so on that is necessary. And so even though the disabled person may be very receptive to ICT, if the caregiver community is not as receptive, then the technology does not reach the disabled person. That is, for example, what has happened with our technology for the deaf-blind. And so, you're absolutely right, we need to work very, very strongly with the caregiver community in this. And I thank you very much for the question. 
Thank you, Aram. Yes. I'm Satish Babu from uh, from India. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I have two points. One is a question relating to one of the developments in this IGF, uh, which is the IDNs, the internationalized domain names. Now, uh, for many people in the third world, uh, mobile devices are their first and only devices. Now, as IDNs come in, uh, it is very, very hard to uh, kind of type these IDNs in uh, different languages uh, on these mobile devices. So I would like to know if there's any uh, initiative from any of the international uh, organizations to address this problem. So otherwise, you're going to lock out a bunch of people. Uh, the second point relates to, uh, uh, as was mentioned about open, free and open source solutions, I believe it is incredibly essential that we use open source solutions so that communities can extend. It's not just a matter of price. It's not just a matter of license. It is a, a matter of the ability of communities to extend the tools that are being centrally created when you kind of uh, talk about a global level. Third point is that uh, relating to this whole gesture, uh, sorry, uh, haptic interfaces, I'd like to add that uh, there are also gesture based, 3D gesture based, like you can take a device and you know move it in 3D space and there are a bunch of libraries available now that will convert that into some user input that you can sensibly interpret. Uh, and also tap based. Uh, acoustics or mechanical. Uh, so some of the technological options that are also available. Uh, and also the point that uh, the cost of these devices are uh, actually plummeting. Uh, so much so that it has been uh, predicted that these will be, the tablet for example, will be free. You attend a conference, you'll get a free tablet. So I don't think we should be restricted by uh, the, 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 the cost of these devices in order to develop solutions. Because tablets are going to be, at least in India for example, we have a $25 tablet which can pretty much do most of these uh, things. So we should not confine, uh, kind of limit ourselves by saying that this is going to be expensive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, your first question is going to be answered by Andrea. Actually, both of them. I'm in standards. I work with the ITU and I run the Joint Coordination Activity on Accessibility and Human Factors. First question, that's in Human Factors, that's ergonomics, that's in study group two. We've just embarked on work, for example, to deal with the Korean alphabet being put on the mobile phone. We can adjust a particular standard to be able to have the alphabet of your choice on there, and it can be standardized. Now, there's no way that we can do that with open source. You have to be able to have some things to be international standards. Licensing is an issue, as you have mentioned. But without international standards, we have no interoperability. So also, there are uh, Arabic countries who have not standardized who have Arabic um, characters on their particular um, mobile phones. And if you tap further enough on many of the European phones, you'll see umlauts and other issues. So that's done in study group two of ITUT. And I'll give you my card because I know pretty much where things are done. Open source is great for certain things in certain areas, but the minute you get into international communication and you get global, we have problems unless those things are taken to the standards bodies. And, of course, licensing is, is told that it doesn't have to be. Like the way WC3 works. So I'm going to pat, he'll go in to explain that a little bit better. Shall I give it to you? So I hope that answers one of the parts of the question. And over to Shadi. I think we just have to watch out a lot with, with the term open source and open standards and what that means uh, for each of us. Uh, but, but that's a, a terminology aspect. So uh, the W3C does develop open standards, and, and, and um, um, th 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 this is a brilliant question. It, it is something that we work a lot with our colleagues and in internationalization, also the colleagues in, in privacy and security, since there are, um, as, as you know, a lot of the backdraws as well in, in, in um, um, phishing and, and, and so on uh, that also relates to the typing in, in, in a character set. Um, we do work a lot with, with, with the Unicode um, uh, on, on that as well. Uh, but I, I think the, the nutshell or, or a core part of what we're talking about would actually relate to our user agent accessibility guidelines, which is actually the interface that the user actually uses to, to interact with the web and how to type in 
characters, how to type information, how to do that accessibly. Uh, now there are a number of ways, uh, voice input and so on, but to be able to actually translate that and verify that yes, that's the address I actually meant and not you know, a zero that looks like an O or something and that takes you to completely different websites um, that, and, and gets even more uh, confusing with characters, uh, character sets that are um, um, not what you would recognize in your own language. Um. Thank you, Shelley. I, I, I think uh, uh, with that we, we are about to conclude the whole session. I think it was a wonderful session, at least for me. It was, uh, it was really wonderful. I learned a lot of things. And I would like to uh, give a hand to, to, to uh, yeah.